Good evening, everyone. Just uh, waiting for another one minute to see how many people come in, then we will start. Okay, so good evening everyone again and welcome to the 2020-2021 SOAS Economics Webinar Series, Intensifying Inequalities and the Limitations of Global Capitalism. So this webinar is aimed at bringing together perspectives that extend our understanding of how inequalities take root in our societies and economics and how this relate to the crisis of global capitalism okay so this series is organized by the SOAS economics department in collaboration with our students in the department as well as in the open economics forum the SOAS feminist economics network and the black economics network so the topic we're going to be discussing today is the elusive quest for structural transformation in Africa. Will China make a difference? And today we have a, a guest speaker and we have a, two other co-chairing coordinators who are going to be discussing the subjects and I'm going to be introducing them to us, you know, one by one as we go. So first of all, let's talk about a lead to of what the topic is all about. So despite various attempts, since independence and the growing economic engagement between China and Africa in the last two decades, structural transformation in Africa has remained elusive. The current engagement with China is strengthening the situation by making Africa more and more commodity dependent for its foreign exchange earnings. This studies in this issue while consciously optimistic about some potential positive contributions of China for Africa's structural transformation, we underscore that such success is conditional on African capability and a from strategic policy, you know, to be able to implement this in a pragmatic way. So I will be introducing our guest speaker from the Addis Ababa University. Um, his name is Al Mayhu. And I'm just going to be reading his biography. We also have Linda Calabris and Carlos Oya, but we take the biography of Alamey first. Okay, so Alamey Geida is professor of economics at Addis Ababa University. He specializes in microeconomics and international economics. Among other things, he has been working on macro model building in Africa. He taught in our department at SOAS some years ago, and it is a research, he's a research associate at SOAS Economics as well as other centers, including the Kenya Institute for Public Policy Research and Analysis and the African Economic Research Consortium. Almehu has written extensively on a variety of topics that shed light on the workings of African economies. His most recent book, published in 2019, is The Historical Origins of the African Economic Crisis from Colonialism to China. I'm going to be reading the biography of Linda Calabris as well, who is going to be part of the discussions for this evening. Linda Calabris is a development economist and research fellow at the ODI in London where she leads on the Institute's China Africa work. She works on trade and investments, Chinese outward investments in Africa and Asia, and the Belt and Road Initiative. She's currently doing a PhD at the Lahu China Institute. I'm introducing Carlos Oya, who is another discussion for this evening. Carlos Oya is Professor of Political Economy of Development at SOAS, University of London, and Development Economist by Training. 
Its main research interests are labor relations and employment, agrarian political economy, development policy, poverty, and research methodology. Carlos has done extensive field-based research on contemporary labor market dynamics in various African countries, especially in Ethiopia, Mozambique, Angola, and Senegal. He has recently led a project on structural transformations and employment outcomes in infrastructure construction and manufacturing sectors in Ethiopia and Angola, but with a special focus on Chinese film. So just before I bring the guest speaker, I'll mail you up. I just want you to know that you can drop your questions, any questions you have for the discussion. So I'll mail you in the chat and uh, we're going to answer them at the end of the discussions. So Dr. Almeida, you have about 40 minutes and um, welcome on board. You can start now. It seems Alemayo has disappeared. <laughs> He's not on the list. It's not a, let me see. It's a, Can't see. Oh. oh dear. I see maybe you might be trying to. Okay. Mm, should we wait about two minutes to see what's going to happen? Yes. Uh, yeah. Sorry to jump in. Uh, this is Sara. I think, uh, yes, Alemayo is back in now. Yeah. I think he's definitely having some issues with uh, his connection. He's okay. back in now. So let's see if he's able to speak. Apologies, everybody, for the technical issue. Alemayo, can you hear us? I think you're back in. Um, so if you can unmute yourself. Oh, yeah. Oh, Wi-Fi. Uh-huh, yeah. While Alamayu is getting ready, we can um, talk about the, the webinar series, if that's okay. OK. 
Yeah, is that okay, Sarah? Yes, of course, sorry. I'm trying because I think now he's back in. Oh, okay. uh, so I don't know if he's able to... I keep on losing him on the list, but no. Apologies, everybody, just bear with us and hopefully we will be able to hear from Alemayo. <clears throat> Hello. Uh, can I ask a question regarding the webinar series? Yes, yes, go ahead. Yes. Yeah. Um, um, this is my first time I'm coming to this uh, because he's my uh, ex colleague. So, how often do you do this webinar and when, uh, if I may ask? Okay, there are there, um, I think there are dates already been allocated, but the next one. Hello, is... hello, can you hear me? Can yeah, you... yeah, it's yeah. coming. Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll stop, I stop, I stop. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Mm, I, I'm, I'm sorry, you know, you know, the internet in Africa, it was working the whole week and I was very happy in the holiday and suddenly it went off. <laughs> I was afraid of the such possibilities, but now I managed to connect with my mobile phone. Oh. And uh, I think at least you can you can hear me, right? Yes, we can. Good. Yes, yes, I can hear okay. you. Good. Sh shall I proceed then? Yes, please. Okay. Good. Thank you very much for uh, inviting me, and I'm sorry for for this uh, inconvenience of the ETO Telecom. Uh, but I hope I'll I'll finish before this the other one goes off. Uh, I can proceed, like Busay. Good. Yes, you can. You have fourteen yeah. minutes. Excellent. Okay. Yeah. Now uh, the. Uh, this presentation is based uh, uh, on a special journal article that we did with African Economic Research Consortium. So actually it was done by myself and the executive director of the ARC, Professor Lemma 
uh, well, the Simbet, the previous uh, director before uh, Jugula Ndungu, and <clears throat> witness uh, Simbani, now with the Reserve Bank of South Africa. So I will basically, what, what, what I will do is, I will uh, give you the picture of the African, <clears throat> the African uh, trade and uh, financial interaction with the with 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 China, and highlight the the major finding of the findings of the three uh, uh, papers that appeared in the special <clears throat> issue of the Journal of African Economics in 2018, from which uh, I have. I have prepared this presentation. Now, <clears throat> uh, so let me let me go straight. And uh, as you all know, the recent economic development in Africa was like up until 2007 quite impressive uh, because the country was growing since 2002 on the average by five percent per annum. <clears throat> this growth was primarily propelled by uh, the demand for primary commodities from emerging economies in general, and China, India in particular. Uh, so uh, it has also significant, this uh, growth and the connection with, with the China that we have, have significant implication for you know, structural uh, transformation in Africa. And structural transformation in turn has strong uh, connection with job creation and uh, poverty reduction. Uh, now the question is uh, whether you know the engagement up until now uh, has has this potential. So that's why I'm I'm going to uh, discuss. Now, if you see uh, uh, African uh, growth is strongly linked with commodity prices, and I have I have divided this into three periods, if you see, as you can see here, the first period uh, is just after independence up until the oil oil crisis. Then you have the second period, the, fa the infamous 1980s and 90s, where commodity price stagnated. And the third period, which I would like to call the Chinese period, where there was a surge in demand for primary commodities. And as a result, there's a huge uh, uh, increase uh, in the price of major uh, commodities that Africa is selling. Now, interestingly, uh, I had a book in 2019 uh, here. I'm taking all this information from there. And if you, you know, uh, link this, this pattern of commodity prices with the growth uh, in the continent, there is, there is a strong linkage be be between the two. As you can see here, you see the growth rate was 4.6 in the previous period and reached the peak of 6.3 in the first period. Then collapsed, uh, collapsed uh, in the 80s and, and 90s, uh, and then it went uh, up uh, in what I call the Chinese period. Now, actually, this figure there is a uh, uh, there is a, a very contested numbers, like if I checked ANCTA numbers, World Bank numbers, the ECA numbers. For instance, the ECA number puts this 2.8 at that time, uh, actually below what uh, person. So in any case, you can see the pattern. And I mean, if you want the recent uh, information, uh, African growth was uh, forecasted from 2013 uh, until now. Uh, to grow on the average three four percent, but following the collapse of commodity prices in 2013, it it declined nearly by 50 percent, and the COVID uh, added to it. <clears throat> now, if you see over period like the last hundred years, uh, this is the terms of trade of Africa for the last hundred years. The top part, and the second part is uh, for the first time in hundred years, uh, uh, we had an improvement in terms of trade of Africa. The second, uh, since 2002, we have this positive terms of that's after 100 uh, years of almost annual decline by 0.8% per, uh, 
we have uh, improvement. This is related to the Chinese, uh, the, the engagement that we have with Chinese in general, in general with emerging economies, but uh, Chinese in particular. Now, this engagement uh, is not only in trade, but also in terms of uh, FDI and financing. So the FDI also has significantly in increased uh, during this period. Uh, for instance, uh, now the trade is about 200 billion. Uh, this is six, 66 times higher than the US 3 billion level uh, that was registered in 1990 or 20 times the 10 billion that we had in 2000. So the trade has grown significantly. Uh, China's rapid economic growth has contributed for this. And African trade with China is invariably bundled with financing like FDI and uh, also what is called vendor financing. So the latter is normally handled by the Exim Bank of uh, uh, Africa. And uh, it is estimated, I estimated it, you know, the non-FDI financing could be over 100 billion uh, right now uh, accumulated. Uh, now, what is the nature of FDI that's coming from China to uh, Africa? Now, in general, you know, despite the media hype about uh, China in Africa, the share of Chinese FDI, FDI stock in the total FDA stock of Africa is very negligible, about 3%. India and China combined is 6%, about 6% of the stock. Uh, so therefore still, you know, it is dominated by uh, traditional uh, uh, partners, uh, the OECD countries. Uh, but when you see the, the existing FDI, you can characterize it as, as follows. One, the flows are largely motivated by the, the desire to secure sources of energy and raw materials, as well as to exploit preferential markets uh, in, emer in uh, advanced countries. The second feature of FDA, Chinese FDA to Africa is, is that with, with this uh, growing FDI, there is a proliferation of a number of small and medium uh, sized firms that usually come with the big Chinese transnational corporations. The third uh, feature is that the FDA coming from uh, China do not seem to be deterred by the nature of governance, like the fragility uh, of a particular country in question. And finally, FDI and other forms of investment flows from China are, as I said, bundled with provision of infrastructure, tied concessional development financing and trade, with no political conditionality uh, attached, unlike, unlike what the finance that we get from the West. Now, but you know, to understand Chinese engagement, investment engagement in Africa, uh, FDI is not a good indicator. The best probably is what I would like to call Chinese quasi FDI or vendor financing, uh, which invariably comes from the Exim Bank of uh, Africa. Now that is huge. Uh, but this is not FDI because the investment is actually carried by a particular African countries. They came up, they came with the financing and the condition is that they have to do the job. Uh, their their uh, multinational companies uh, have to do the job. Now, if you see that financing, uh, it is estimated uh, probably between 2001 and 2010, it is about 67 billion. And I extrapolated uh, this figure uh, in 2019, it, it, it reached uh, over 100 billion, 105 billion to be specific. Now, when you see this finance, first, the majority of this loan were infrastructure related and Chinese firms are the one uh, building it, uh, invariably directed at facilitating the export of primary commodities from the port uh, to, uh, from the source to the port. Second, compared to concessional financing uh, that the majority of uh, countries in the continent used to get from uh, international financial institutions, it is very expensive. Uh, for instance, in some, uh, very, it is very secretive, but in some of the Ethiopian projects I checked, 
uh, the interest rate alone is LIBOR plus three percentage points. So comparatively expensive. Compare this to uh, the average that you get from IDA of just 0.7%. <clears throat> Uh, they are characterized by uh, potential risk that includes indebtedness, vulnerability to global economic shocks, and political and strategic vulnerability of Africa uh, to China. And fourth, if individual African countries are exposed too much, like for instance in Ethiopia or in Djibouti, uh, there is also a strategic uh, vulnerability, a risk. The, uh, probably you have heard what happened in, in Sri Lanka. Uh, Sri Lanka was so indebted that the Chinese have to take even the port. And I think there is a similar stories about uh, uh, the utilities in Zambia. So finally, this kind of financing uh, also a vehicle for Chinese multinationals uh, global strategy of expansion by helping them to win and involve in various uh, projects in the continent. So the sheer magnitude of this figure uh, shows you uh, how important this, this kind of finance is. Now, generally this is the pattern, huge threat, huge financing, both FDI and uh, uh, quasi FDI, but the quasi FDI is the most important one. Now, given this picture, what would, what would be the challenge and opportunities uh, of engaging with China for Africa? This is from ARE, ARC studies. Uh, earlier, we did about 22 country case studies uh, from uh, in ARC, I was involved in it. Later on, we, we tried to summarize that and we had uh, uh, a, a sort of a plenary session for policymakers in Dakar, Senegal. So the summary of this result is, uh, I'm, I'm summarizing three papers here. One is by Justin Lin, uh, now probably in Peking University, Previously, he used to be uh, the vice uh, president of the World Bank and uh, uh, Burton at uh, John Hopkins, who, who specializes in China-Africa relation uh, and my paper. So three papers, we summarized them here. Now, <clears throat> the major issue for Africa, the policy issue for uh, Africa is, you know, what, what, what are we getting from this engagement? What is Chinese economic impact on Africa? How can the China-Africa economic partnership could be leveraged to enhance industrial upgrading or structural transformation uh, in the continent? Uh, these are uh, issues. Now, uh, indeed, this is very important issue because you know, recent poverty and growth studies uh, shows that, again, done by ARC, and there is an excellent review by my, my, my uh, colleague, Abbe Mellis about the, the poverty issue in the last uh, 15 years. Uh, what he concluded is that despite this huge growth propelled by uh, the engagement of Africa with emerging economics, which was on the average 5% per annum, the, the effect on poverty reduction is extremely limited. Poverty reduced only by four percentage points, you know, throughout this huge growth period. Now, if you compare that, like I got a picture here, if you see it, you know, the headcount ratio in Africa from 1981, 2008, and 2018 now, if you see it, it just declined from 55, 51, and 47. This is the headcount. Uh, ratio using $125 PPP. Now, if you compare it to Asia, the same period, you see in, in Asia and East Asia, it dropped from 77 to 14 and now to zero. And you see, you can compare it with the, with the condition in, in Africa. Now, actually in numbers, in the 81, 163 million people have been poor. In 1980, this increased to 313, and now, right now, it is 430. So, what is the difference between the two? We observe structural trans serious structural transformation in, in East Asia, and in fact, even in South Asia. I didn't have the I didn't put the figure here, but we missed that in Africa. <clears throat> uh, 
Now, if you see the structural change, you know, I mean, this is a big literature about at least if you use the standard definition that a movement from low pro productivity area to high productivity area, you can see here an interesting picture that I took it actually from World Bank study in 2016. Uh, you see in the 80s, this, this has, you know, the x-axis is uh, sector employment share, while the y-axis, I mean, the x-axis is uh, value added per capita. Uh, this is in manufacturing. This, this is the, the best indicator, the manufacturing. Now, as you see here, <clears throat> the blue one was the 1980s here. And in 1990, it declined, the green one. In 2000, further declined. And 2010, nearly now, or right now, it has further declined. So actually, there is no structural trans transformation in the continent. Uh, as you can see from uh, this data, actually, it is uh, getting worse. And on the other hand, there are movements from agricultural sector to another sector, the service sector. Here you can see, you know, the, this is the, for the service sector. In the 80 was the blue one. Then 90, it has increased. In 2000, it has increased. And then 2010. Now, this would have been an interesting shift had our service sector have been as sophisticated as the one we have in the West, but it is not. You know, the majority of the service sector, if you take, for instance, in Ethiopia, uh, the urban, in urban areas, 40% of the population is in the informal sector, basically. And these are very, uh, very weak uh, sectors. Uh, as, as you can see here, the wholesales, retails, and micro or micro firms. Now, there is, so generally the pattern is, you know, countries that transited, basically transited to a service sector and in the manufacturing sector, there is no really tra structural transformation. Now, people are saying, I mean, there are a lot of uh, studies, the latest one being by uh, by uh, the, there is a wider study. Basically, they are saying you no, know, uh, no. The African structural transformation is different now than Asia. It is uh, going to ICT-based services, tourism, and transport, uh, and these are have characteristics similar similar to the firm, to the firm like it means. Uh, scale economics are important, agglomeration is important. Therefore, we need to think differently. That is sort of the finding of uh, a Brookings Institute study and a wider study. And, and they think uh, that this is like manufacturing uh, and we shouldn't worry about that. But I, I very much doubt that uh, because this reminds me of the classic uh, Prebish uh, article about uh, about the terms of uh, deterioration of the developing countries, where he basically says, if you specialize in primary commodities, you are specializing in an area where the scope for technical progress is limited. You are specializing in an area where the market structure is not to your advantage, i.e. the manufactured goods are sold in a fixed price market while primary commodities are sold in a flexi uh, price market and invariably uh, uh, consumer benefit uh, in the latter one, but not in the former one. So if you guys just say check that classic article, you can see uh, uh, this are not, uh, according to my opinion, a good uh, areas. And as you can also see from you know the effect of COVID uh, on these sectors uh, in, the, in the last couple of years, you can see how vulnerable it is to depend on such uh, sectors. Now, given this picture, what what was the message of the DRC studies? Three of them. The Lean study, uh, you know, he, he examined the Chinese economic rise and the opportunities that the Chinese rise is giving to Africa, and 
you know, tro- tries to draw a lesson for us. And he basically concluded this. One, he says, uh, the Chinese growth is an opportunity for Africa, uh, but if Africa wants to benefit from this, it requires clarity of vision, state capacity, and willingness to implement commit credible uh, with uh, to implement a policy of development by credible, uh, committed, and capable government. That is basically his conclusion. Uh, he says, you know, China, uh, Chinese adopted a pragmatic, a gradual, dual track approach, which provided necessary protection to non viable firms in the priority sectors uh, to avoid their collapse, while at the same time simultaneously liberalizing uh, the entry of private enterprises, joint ventures, and the DI. Uh, so you guys have basically, Lin says, you guys have to follow that. And he said, again, African countries should begin by building up the necessary infrastructure, he says. That is that is key for him. And improving business environment, especially for the sectors where they have a comparative advantage, uh, you have to do that. That was his, his basically uh, message of his, his paper. Then... He said the market on its, he basically says the market on its own will not deliver what is uh, need, required uh, in terms of structural transformation. Therefore, both the state and the market have important roles to play, according to Lee. Then finally, he says in China, there is a huge uh, shift in economic activity, what they call rebalancing, like focusing internally. And because of this, there is a rising weight in China, which implies that the relocation of labor intensive manufacturing out of China. He estimated that to be about 85 million strong. And he says, uh, this is an opportunity for African countries, uh, uh, you know, to, 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 to take advantage of uh, this firmness uh, moving out of, out of China and create job for, for its people. So for this, he says, a strategic and pragmatic approach is necessary. That was his message. Now, the other study, basically a micro study was done by uh, Bertigam. I hope I pronounced it one. Now, she she's a very, uh, you know, very famous person on this area uh, uh, at John Hopkins. Uh, she attempts to characterize Chinese manufacturing investment because, you know, manufacturing investment, the key for this structural uh, transformation. Uh, she said basically uh, firms that coming to Africa are motivated by uh, industrial uh, gradient transfer from China owing to the rising cost of labor uh, uh, in China uh, and excess capacity in China. So she focused on four countries. She had a case study on Ethiopia, Ghana, and Nigeria and Tanzania. Uh, these are selected on the basis of uh, having a large number of uh, Chinese manufacturing firms. Uh, and then uh, uh, she just takes stock of the current state of knowledge on Chinese manufacturing investment in Africa, where they, that she came up uh, with the conclusion that Chinese manufacturing today in Africa stood about 4.6 billion in 2016. That time, the total Chinese investment in Africa was about 24 billion. So the, fam- the manufacturing was about 4.6. Uh, in terms of the scope of investment, uh, she found that most of the Chinese manufacturing firms were engaged in leather, products, textiles, wearing apparels, rubber, plastic products, and metal and mineral products. Uh, they are, uh, there is a, a little bit of exporters and also import substitution. So they are basically interstate manufacturing uh, firms. So these different types of Chinese manufacturing firms, she says, basically poses different opportunities and challenges to Africa. Therefore, it is up to the Africans to identify those challenges and opportunities and optimize from that. That was basically her message. <clears throat> now, the, the other paper is mine. As I showed you initially in, in my slides, uh, I, be, I was basically saying that the engagement uh, was huge in terms of both FDI and trade, 
But I argue that the engagement does, does little to move Africa away from uh, reliance on primary commodity trade into manufacturing. In addition, uh, I argue that uh, whatever growth is coming, it is a low quality growth. Low, by low quality growth, uh, I mean uh, a growth that doesn't lead to structural transformation and has job creation and new employment. Uh, and uh, I also argue that this engagement, because you know price of commodities are very high and very profitable for us, is locking in African countries on primary export sector, a sector where the scope for technological development is limited and generally characterized by deteriorate in terms of trade and volatility of prices, as I showed you uh, earlier. Now. Poor quality growth, uh, there are two economic studies, one I did and the other than by Collier, basically shows that the primary commodity rise leads only to short-term growth, not long-term growth. Actually, uh, the, Colli the Collier's uh, paper is mu uh, much more pessimistic because it says in the long run, the growth effect is negative. My, my econometrics says in the long run, it's nothing, zero, but in the short run, it has benefits. So that's, as a result, it is a low quality growth. There is also, you know, in the manufacturing sector, there's a competitive trade to manufacture firms in Africa. Uh, there is a vulnerability to macroeconomic ramification like the disease, governance of resource sector. Uh, so these are challenges. Uh, the opportunities are improvement in terms of trade, as I showed you earlier, for the first time in, in the last hundred years. Uh, infrastructure, you know, the Chinese built a lot of uh, infrastructure in the continent, and the finance it. That is also an opportunity. And then the potential, the positive potential implication of the Chinese rebalancing. That is when they focus to the higher ladder of manufacturing and exporting there is an opportunity for uh, their firms to move to Africa and job creation. Uh, so these are, I think, uh, the advantages. However, in general, according to my opinion, among my studies, that the, the persistence of challenges as opposed to opportunities uh, in the current engagement shows to, to me lack of both human and institutional capacity to, to make advantage of these things. So our human capital expertise, our uh, capacity in the country is so weak in terms of A, negotiating with them, in terms of implementing wh whatever is negotiated, and in terms of technological transfer, technological and managerial transfer to us is very weak. Therefore, as long as this weakness continues, I, I, I am you know, less optimistic than the two, the two authors, unless we address this. It's not the Chinese problem, it's our problem. So we have to do something about it. So the challenge of coming up with appropriate policy or strategy, in short, the Chinese have a strategy when they come to Africa and we don't. And that has to do with expertise, human capital and strategic engagement. So unless we do that, uh, my conclusion is perhaps we will repeat what we have with industrial countries in the last, what, 100 or 200 years. Thank you very much. I'm glad I finished before uh, this thing went off again. Thank you very much. Thank you, very much. You, you finished quite some time. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to call on Carlos Oya now, one of our discussants, to give us some contributions and observations on the on the slides thank you Klaus. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me and, and participate in this uh, great discussion and meeting Alemayu once again after many years I haven't seen him um, and online counts uh, we, we're getting used to it so um, my I've got a few comments basically um, uh, building on 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 the on the article that um, Alemayu has been referring to in the last part of of his presentation, so my comments are basically uh, focused on that that article, but also um, on a few points that Alemayu has made um, um, during the presentation, which relate to this. 
So I think um, a, a key outcome of, of the presentation on this paper is identifying what we consider um, three key vectors in understanding Africa-China relations, um, you know, trade, finance, and foreign direct investment. Um, it's quite clear. I mean, the, the evidence so far is, is clear that these vectors have been uh, dynamic uh, over the past uh, 20 years at least. But also, and I think uh, Alemayu has referred to this, um, it's interesting to consider the interconnections between them. It's, it's hard to really understand uh, either trade, finance, or FDI from China to African countries without looking at the interconnections. And I think there was there were a few examples um, from Alemayu which reflected these these connections. I think it's important, I mean, that would be one initial premise to consider variation across countries. Variation is important within Africa. It's hard to, uh, um, to articulate arguments about these relations and the implications for Africa without considering the quite substantial variation that takes place across different African countries. Um, I think it's interesting to, uh, to consider for example, contrast between you know Alemayu's own country, Ethiopia, and its experience with with uh, with these Chinese different vectors, and the experience of other African countries, for example, uh, um, Angola, uh, which was one of the countries we covered in our project on employment outcomes. So I think contrasting these different experiences and and what's been done in different places um, is quite useful in terms of understanding what is possible. Um, and, and what can be achieved given the serious constraints and, and uh, problems that challenges that Alemayu has re referred to. So I think um, a key issue that comes from uh, these three different papers that Alemayu has discussed and, and his own work is, is there is uncertainty on, on some of the outcomes, some differences in the assessment in terms of how optimistic or pessimistic different researchers are. And, and, and some of these differences also have to do with the different methods uh, that different authors use. I mean, certainly uh, the kind of analysis that Mayu does is very different from uh, Deborah Brautigam and, and her team on FDI. So I think with, with these premises, I would like to make four main points uh, to, you know, trying to contribute to the discussion and perhaps add some elements um, to the key question that we're asking here, whether uh, China will make or can make a difference uh, for the quest for structural transformation in Africa. And, and I do share some of the pessimism uh, of, of Alemayo in terms of the record so far. So yes, if you look at the record in terms of industrialization and, and, and uh, structural transformation in the 80s, 90s and 2000s, it clearly there's very little to, um, uh, to report on. Now, my first point is on, on the linkages between finance infrastructure and industrialization. I think um, what Alemayo has called these Chinese quasi-FDI is, is, is an important issue. I, I, I don't call it, I think it's, it's important not to confuse this with, with FDI in the sense that this is finance that is provided by, you know, Exim and many other uh, development uh, um, agencies and, and, and banks in, in China to finance uh, infrastructural development. The, the, the particularity is that the executors of many of these projects or the vast majority of these projects are Chinese, very well established Chinese uh, construction companies. So uh, strictly speaking, what these companies do is basically the export of construction services on the back of these, of these finance. Um, and it's important to make this distinction because indeed some of these companies, and, and especially the, the, the very famous ones like um, uh, Sino Hydro, which is now Power China, uh, some of them have actually invested in some African countries. So they've turned projects eventually into actual FDI in the construction sector. So it's important to, to, to make this distinction because in some countries there is some substantial construction FDI, real FDI, and in other cases, what you have is this export of construction services. But my point here is more about the linkages with the um, quest for structural transformation. And I think a lot of what's happening, and we're talking the last 10, 15, 20 years, in some countries less than that, has been a, a lot of uh, um, infrastructural development in key areas of infrastructures especially in communications and power generation. Now, my question is, 
are these kinds of infrastructural development not conducive to medium and long-term um, um, processes of industrialization? Don't they create the kinds of conditions that are missing in many countries for industrial investment to be uh, minimally profitable? So I think it's important to always remind ourselves that these investments, which have a long-term term maturity, uh, can indeed uh, substantially contribute to uh, the process of structural transformation towards the kinds of high value and high productivity activities that uh, Alemayo was referring to. And I think countries like Angola and Ethiopia are, are interesting examples where you do see a significant infrastructure boom, and this infrastructure boom is creating some basic conditions for industrial investments to uh, to take place, particularly in the case of Ethiopia. There is another linkage that is often um, forgotten in a lot of the literature, which is how these kinds of uh, projects uh, generate linkages for the um, expansion of domestic production capabilities in the industries for building materials. So think about the cement industry, steel, or um, materials such as bricks and cement products. Some countries, and indeed Ethiopia is an example of that, Angola, uh, uh, interestingly also an example of these sectors uh, actually growing really fast on the back of some of these uh, um, finance deals. So let's not forget about those dynamics because they may have implications in the future in terms of the development of domestic manufacturing capabilities. Then my second point is about FDI and different paths to structural transformation. I think Deborah Brautigam and her team uh, have done quite a lot of work on these, and they clearly show that how Chinese FDI is uneven, variegated, with different kinds of uh, um, um, aims and aspirations, different kinds of logics. And it's important to unpack these different flows of FDI. And indeed, for a case like Ethiopia, I do have uh, good examples of the kinds of, of geese, as they call them, uh, um, that fly from China to uh, to Africa. And what is interesting is is how to to what extent a lot of these in industrial firms are market seeking. To what extent they they're, they're not just using some African countries as potential platforms for export to third markets, i.e., those that are trying to take advantage of Agoa type of uh, preferences, but also those who are you know, just basically finding opportunities. And the paradox here is that, and, and Alemayu makes reference to you know, how Chinese products compete with African uh, uh, producers and therefore you know, they create a disincentive to industrialization. Well, things are going on. I mean, things are changing. And, and to what extent many of those Chinese exporters of goods are turning into manufacturing investors in a number of African countries, so basically sort of switching roles in, in, in a way that is likely to generate um, um, capabilities in these, in these sectors. Now, uh, my third um, um, point is an area where I do agree with, with, uh, with Alemayu quite strongly, and that is the centrality of African agency and to develop homegrown development strategies. And the fact that, you know, by and large, the outcomes that we'll be able to see or not see from, from these engagements will very much depend on what African governments, African firms uh, do uh, on the back of these potential, you know, opportunities. Um, and that is, I think, particularly important in the case of, of government policy um, um, and, and therefore needs to be uh, tackled. I think um, Alemayu's pessimism about human and institutional capacities is um, evidence-based to an extent, but I think it's slightly too pessimistic. I think if we look at variation across African countries, we, we do find instances where, where there has been at least some agency that has led to decisions and investment, public investment that has indeed taken, has taken advantage of some of the opportunities that we're talking about here. Uh, interestingly, I think Ethiopia is a good example of that. Um, the problem is not so much capacity as such. I mean, capacity can be developed. Capacity is, is not a, a static issue. It's, it's something that change, changes over time. It requires investment. I think the key uh, um, um, sort of uh, challenge and, and threat is politics. And, and to what extent these sorts of processes 
can be sustained or not over time. You know, what is the, the, the continuity of some of the good examples of, of policies and interventions that have at least taken advantage of some of these opportunities that we're discussing here. Now, let me finish with the, with the methodological point. I think if, if we want to answer the research question of whether China can make a difference in the quest for structural transformation, um, basically it's too early to say. Uh, Cross-country regression analysis of trade flows with data up to 2015 are unlikely to help us answer this question. We may be able to answer this question perhaps by 2030 or even later and assess some of these issues and some of these outcomes with longitudinal methods within countries, not just across countries. Of course, the patterns across Africa are also important, but I think it's, it's crucial to really look at what's going on within countries and, and follow up over time. So even a country like Ethiopia, for example, most manufacturing foreign direct investment, and it's not just Chinese, although the Chinese has been clearly dominant compared to other foreign investors, has really kicked off in numbers from 2015 and not earlier. So it's, it's a very fluid situation. A lot has happened in the last five years. And of course, a lot of these, and Ethiopia again is an example of that, is potential, can potentially be undone by you know, political processes, political dynamics that uh, threaten uh, these, uh, these uh, uh, ongoing dynamics. So I think we have to be a little bit uh, careful with you know, how far can we go in terms of answering this kind of research question when the issue of structural adjustment is indeed a long-term issue. What we do know is that there has been very limited structural transformation as we usually understand it in the period 1980 to 2010. That's definitely the case. And I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Carlos. Just to um, let everyone know, you can please drop your comments and contributions or questions in the chat for Professor Almayo to answer when um, we're done with the next discussion. So I would like to introduce Linda. Please, you have about 10 minutes. Thank you. Thank you very much. And first of all, let me say I'm very excited to be here. I'm also a former student of this department from a few years ago. So it's really my pleasure to be here to be part of this discussion. And also thank you, Alemayu, for this very comprehensive presentation with a very long historical overview also of structural transformation in Africa, which I think was a really good um, reminder to all of us uh, about the trends that have been taking place. Um, I do agree with you know, the analysis that has been undertaken and, and also with a few of the conclusions, for example, the fact that African countries should take a more strategic approach in the way they engage with China, especially on the economic side. But I also think, and I'm also actually on the more positive view um, in terms of the impact of, of Chinese investment and Chinese economic engagement in general, including finance, including trade and so on and so forth. So I think I would partly characterize things a bit differently and partly I think also look at what is happening, maybe not so much at the macro, but at the micro level that can really help us inform our view. So I think, I mean, Carlos already alluded to this basically, but it's true that a lot of the investment um, uh, in infrastructure, a lot of the infrastructure finance that was um, provided by China to African countries was really done to, you know, sort of um, build roads and ports and things to allow, you know, um, the use of natural resources. But it's also true that a lot of this is not in that same, does not have that same scope. So we can think about um, several examples of, you know, energy generation um, or roads that feed, uh, that, that allow people to actually move across countries and to trade among themselves as well. Uganda, for example, it's one country that's not normally on the sort of China-Africa discussion radar, really has um, uh, seen in recent years the, the construction or the starting of the works on two power plants. And this is a country that really needs a lot more energy generation than it currently has. So, you know, we see a lot of examples of, uh, of investment of infrastructure works as well that can, infrastructure projects that can really enable um, increase in productive capacity in African countries. Um, moreover, I think at the micro level, we also see a lot of positive signs of, uh, of the impact of Chinese investments or Chinese financing in African countries. So I work with a, um, a sort of a research program, UK funded research program that um, has 
um, undertaken several uh, research projects in the past few years, and actually Carlos projects was, was one of these. Um, and recently we put together a synthesis report of the main findings of these studies uh, in the past few years. And we looked at how Chinese uh, trade aid uh, finance investment into Africa helps and supports economic transformation. Actually, we don't, we don't just refer to, to structural transformation. We also refer to increases in productivity in different sectors of the economy. And so structural transformation plus increases in productivity is what we refer to as, as, as economic transformation. And we really found a lot of positive examples of um, China's role in Africa in this sense. So in terms of enhancing productivity, so the sort of productivity part of economic transformation, we see a lot of examples. We see that Chinese firms engaging in Africa really contribute to a lot of knowledge and technology transfer. And this is in many ways um, through trainings that are provided on the job very often, but also in some cases, some rare cases through overseas training where African workers actually go to China to be trained. And this happens for specific services and specific firms. It's not a really widespread um, instance, but it does happen. The Chinese government also finances agri-tech centers in Africa where uh, agricultural technologies that are developed or used in China are also brought and transferred and taught or shared with, uh, with African agronomists and, and, and scientists. On top of knowledge and technology transfer, we see a lot of spillovers um, among firms. Actually, spillovers can be divided into two types, spillovers among firms in the same sector and spillovers among firms in different sectors through buyer supply relations. So spillovers among firms in the different sectors have actually been quite rare. Uh, they don't happen commonly, but this is not just unique to Chinese investment, actually. This is broader and it's found in the economic literature, but specifically about vertical spillovers. So the spillovers that happens between buyers and suppliers. Uh, so for example, if we have a Chinese firm buying inputs from African firms, or if we have a Chinese firms providing inputs to African firms, we see that uh, this raises capacity of African firms quite often. The problem with this is actually that this beneficial relationship with, between firms do not happen as often as they should. Actually, they are quite um, rare, especially the long-term ones that are particularly beneficial don't really happen very often. Um, we also see that one way in which um, China Chinese investment or Chinese trade actually in this case helps uh, economic transformation in Africa and helps increases in productivity is through uh, trade in equipment and in machinery, for example. So these really enable African firms to purchase this equipment and this machinery that maybe is cheaper than what they were buying before. And this allows them to start producing and to start maybe getting into new activities. Um, so for example, a few years back, I was, I was in Rwanda and I went to interview uh, the owner of a potato chips factory. And they just bought machines from, from China to produce potato chips. And they were saying that, first of all, these machines were cheaper, so they could use them to, to produce uh, and they could buy them, which they couldn't afford before. But also they were in a way simpler in terms of the technology. So if one of these machines breaks down, then one of the workers in this factory, in this random factory, can look at it and understand where the problem is and sort of fix it, which is normally not the case with more sophisticated machinery um, that's produced in other countries. So the technological gap, the technological distance in a way is smaller between technologies employed in China and technologies used in Africa. Although, of course, um, trade with China, especially manufacturer trade, has some potential for the industrialization as well when it competes directly with, um, with African products. And we've seen a few examples of this, especially in countries with a uh, much more developed manufacturing sector in Africa, such as South Africa, for example. And that is not commonly happening in many countries. Um, in terms, so we spoke about the sort of uh, increasing productivity side of economic transformation. In terms of the structural transformation side, though, there's also a lot that Chinese investment and trade and finance are contributing to. So one thing, one side is on the investment, on the FDI in particular. And I think, Alema, you already mentioned that this is actually quite small in Africa, and this is true. Um, but still, if we compare Chinese FDI to Africa, with the investment of the largest um, sort of FDI flows, which are coming from uh, the US, Netherlands, France, and the UK. These 
European and countries and the US mostly invest in two areas, financial services and extractives. So it's really just these two that dominate investments from the West to Africa. Whereas Chinese investments are a lot more diversified. They may be smaller, but Chinese firms also invest in agri-tech and agribusiness, in, uh, in manufacturing, in construction and so on. And this is really supporting the creation of these new sectors and the development of these new sectors in African countries, these more modern sectors that really promote African transformation. So it's, it's really a small flow of investment, but it's extremely beneficial, I believe. And what we would need is something that's more similar to that actually. Uh, rather than more of the old type of investment coming from Europe, for example. Um, and in terms, and so it's not just investment that helps structural transformation. As Carlos mentioned, I think it's also infrastructure. So he already mentioned the sort of support to industrialization um, of, the, of infrastructure development. But more in general, infrastructure is very important to reduce production costs for all investors, for all producers, not just the Chinese, but everyone else, other foreign and African domestic investors who want to invest. If there's a road, if there's an industrial park that's created, that really can lower production costs, can allow, uh, can allow others to invest as well. Special economic zones or industrial parks are a very interesting example in particular, especially in some countries, um, Ethiopia, but also Ghana, Nigeria, and so on. They are present and they're usually financed by um, through Chinese loans and, um, and very often built by Chinese companies. But Chinese companies also very often become leading manufacturers in these zones. So there are others who invest as well, but Chinese companies are usually present. So this is a series of ways, a, a, a sort of a, a series of ways in which Chinese trade investment and finance really facilitate um, uh, economic transformation in Africa. And I think it's really important to look at the entire picture and to look at it in terms of trends. So Carlos also mentioned the, the, the important time factor in a way. We see that at the moment, structural transformation in Africa has not yet happened or it hasn't happened in a way uh, that we wish it had. But we also see that there are some positive signs and there are some positive trends, and these can be further developed, I think, in the coming years. So I have a lot of other things that I'd like to say, but I think I'll stop here for now. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Linda, for your comments and contributions. Um, Professor Anmahu, there are some questions here in the chat. So I would like to read them out to you so you can answer them all you know, at the same time. Um, there are about three questions. Hopefully it's not too much going on at the same time. So the first one is from Abra Suleiman. And it says, my question is to Prof Alimayuho. How do you put the fast growth in Ethiopia recorded over the years? So how do you put the fast growth in Ethiopia recorded over the years? How important was China's role in this? And it goes, uh, how... How do you take the optimistic view of, say, Dr. Al Kibe on industrial packs and the like? So that's questions from Abra. Would you like me to go over it again or you were able to get them? Prof? Ooh. Aime, who are you there? Oh, the internet. I got, oh, yeah. I okay. All right. I, I, I got I can see them in the chat. In the chat. So second one, I think my question, this is from Nengi Aika. I think my question takes this takes this away a bit from the main discussion. But to increase growth in sub-Saharan Africa, do you think we should be taking lessons from China's industrialization process? Does it make sense to especially given the very different initial conditions in China from the early 1900s, that is command economy, highly traced levels already to see when compared to SSA at the time. Then there's another question here. This is from uh, Sarah. It says, in addition to the sectors of trade, finance and FDI, I wonder if the speakers think that employment creation is another channel through which we can assess the role that China is playing in fostering growth and development in African countries. Okay, 
I think there's a response from Carlos about that. And two more questions from Ilu. In relation to employment creation, how African countries can prevent China's inclination towards hiring Chinese workers instead of local workers in Africa development projects? It is known that some countries put some barriers in percentage of hiring Chinese workers. However, it seems that not many African countries have such bargaining power. Yeah, I think those are the questions in the chat. You can, you can go ahead and respond, please. Excellent, thank you very much. <clears throat> uh, I mean, uh, thank you very much, uh, Carlos uh, and Linda. It's nice to see you, Carlos, after a long time. Uh, I, I completely agree with you guys. I mean, it, this is the disadvantage of uh, having a macro and overall overall picture. And uh, I'm sure as you, as, uh, as you very well say, uh, that if we go deeper into specific country contexts, uh, there, are, there will be different. So the, I, I completely agree with you. This, this is the disadvantage of having a macro and general perspective, but I, I hope it gives you a perspective uh, to focus in a particular country uh, to have a, a, a general picture. Infra definitely infrastructure, as, as you Carlos said, is very, very important. Uh, but is it like, uh, I think in the, in the book that I did, I tried to see all these infrastructures, uh, huge uh, in terms of, and I, I forgot the figure, over $35 billion, but invariably it is like resource to port. So, you know, like depending on your strategic engagement, you could have tuned it, tuned it to uh, to focus on what you think in a particular country in a growth in a growth centers. So that 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 is missing. What uh, when I see it, market seeking definitely. Actually, the uh, as Carlos said, some of the firms are market seeking. I think. Uh, uh, the, one of the paper focus on, on characterization of. Uh, those firms. Uh, uh, politics, definitely, uh, Carlos. At the end of the day, you know, the, the politics is the most important. A, a, a glaring example is in Ethiopia. Like, uh, probably, uh, I can also relate it to, to Abrar's question. Abrar, nice to have, uh, to see him. He, he was my colleague at the Department of Economics. So probably I'll combine the two to answer that. Uh, like a good example in Ethiopia is, you know, like the growth uh, had been quite quite nice in Ethiopia in the last 15 years, uh, although it's not as, as exaggerated as that 11% per annum. I did, I did sort of uh, investigative paper and came up about 6 7% per annum. Because when you do, uh, I fitted a, a solo model and tried to identify the source of growth, I found it that out of 11, what the government says officially 11%, uh, the labor contribution is about 0.1%, the capital is around that 2.1, the rest seven something is total factor productivity. And as you know, total factor productivity even in OECD is like 2%. And probably in the paper I did before, uh, before probably this paper, this data is touched, uh, I got 1% labor productivity, which varies with weather condition. So if you add that, you came six, probably six, seven percent. But that's quite quite nice by African standards. You don't you don't have to exit to exaggerate it. Now, what is the role of China? Like the financing of this this investment is came uh, if you see the financing through monetization of deficit and external borrowing. I mean, the money supply in Ethiopia during this period, 10 years, increased from 62 billion to 970 billion by average annual growth of 30%. At the same time, our debt, external debt, increased phenomenally, like it became $29 billion. That is uh, huge for Ethiopia because the domestic and the, the external debt added together become 60% of the GDP. And out of those 29 external debt, about 70 or 80 billion is from China. 
So how is it not been for them? I think we wouldn't have a chain, uh, a pain that 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 growth in all sense of the word. But that for me, actually, I I I I usually think that because we are not strategically and in an informed way engaged with them, probably we wasted an opportunity they gave us. That, that's the conclusion I came up with doing this stuff, and that boils down to my major point that. African expert base in negotiation, technological transfer, human capital formation, when you do a particular project is generally missing. And unless we beat that throughout the continent, we will lose. We will end up being uh, you know, primary community producers. That, that's what I'm afraid. Although I should you know, lower, lower that, uh, pessimism given, given Linda's and Carlos, uh, Carlos points earlier. Now, uh, coming to, I agree with Linda's uh, spillover uh, uh, argument, productivity, I, I, didn't, I didn't see that paper, I have to see. Uh, and compared to China and West, uh, you're absolutely right. And, you know, in general, invariably, both, both uh, East and West engaged in the primarily in the resource sector. And uh, the data, what is coming in particular China, it says they are diversifying to manufacturing and services. But I, I you know, the published papers I saw used projects per sector instead of value per sector. When you do it value per sector, I did it. And I got like 2% of super, very small. Even the di what is called diversified. And whatever diversification is invariably goes to telecom sector uh, and IT sector, which is related to privatization of uh, those, those stuff. So what has to, to, to see deeper on those issues? I agree. Methodology, uh, uh, well, uh, my, uh, Carlos, I know Carlos is very, very good at life all of them. So <laughs> I'm a macroeconomist and I agree, you know, the, there is, a, there is a trade off between depth and width uh, of a study. And I, I agree that I think if we do a lot of micro stuff, we, we get it more informed. Probably related to this was uh, Abra's point about industrial parks in Ethiopia uh, and the role of China. Huge industrial parks. Are you, am I optimist as are, I'm not, I'm not really. Because as I say, it's not an informed way of engagement. For instance, just give you an, an idea. Like uh, the, one of the companies, the big shoe companies uh, came to Ethiopia in Eastern zone and employed a lot of people, uh, but the logist, although they came to reduce their labor cost, which they claim by reduced by 22%, Hajun, I, don't know, I forgot the name, uh, a, shoe, a big shoe company. So they, say, they claimed uh, their wage reduced by 22%. I believe it is more than that because the average wage in, in, in China is about 400, uh, $500, uh, and in Ethiopia, is $35. This huge reduction in the weight cost. And actually, I did a paper studying that, and you wouldn't believe under what bad condition workers are working below poverty line, below poverty line. So although they came to that, but the logistic cost increased eightfold, according to the manager. OK? So, you know, Carlos' point of infrastructure and all those stuff, probably, I don't know, coming 10 years, I don't expect, but it should have reused that, that stuff, but it did it, and hopefully we'll, we'll reuse it in the future. So unless we did the assignment, our part, we may not benefit. In Ethiopia, you know, the parts are pretty much informed by political repositioning, especially, than cost. Okay. So by the time you reach the, the port of Djibouti, your cost could be larger than you know the the, the minimum cost globally. Uh, so that kind of rationalization is required, I guess. And now, uh, good. What what else? Uh, there are two three points. One is, uh, can we learn from China industrialization? I I don't know. I mean, I'm, I'm not uh, expert on on Chinese industrialization because I don't know very much, but. Uh, uh, as, the, as you said, I think I identified about four points, initial condition, which distinguish 
African countries and given their colonial history from China or East Asia. And one of, one of them is, as you said, low level of infrastructure, low literacy rate. Uh, like I was in the book, in my book, if you see 2019 book, I'm comparing Taiwan and uh, Taiwan and Korea with, uh, with African countries at the initial stage. I found, for instance, the Taiwanese, by the, by the time of independence, by their 70% was literate and compared to Zambia, which is almost zero. Okay, so if you compare those initial conditions, they are different, but still we can learn, we can learn. And there are some African countries who, who learned it good and did a good example. And I, I included a case study in my book was uh, Mauritius and Botswana. And it has to do with Carlos' point, political inclusiveness, political stability, vision of the, the, the leaders, and those kinds of stuff. So we can learn, but you know, a uh, smart way of learning it. Uh, employment could be a direction, another channel. Invariably, you know, the trade and investment and financing goes through employment because you know the trade creates employment. You know, we call firms engaging in trade are creating employment. The investment also creates, uh, uh, like in Ethiopia, if you go to industrial parks, con road construction, railway construction, there are employment, but the, the last person says, what about the, you know, the inclination of Chinese to employ, uh, to employ uh, Chinese? Uh, I think the, it is the responsibility of the government. Like for instance, if you compare Zambia and Ethiopia, in Zambia, any Chinese car, any Chinese can go and start shopping. When I was going to China, to Zambia, to Saka, sometime, some years back, probably seven, eight years back, the supermarkets were completely run by Zambians. And after the Chinese, this completely inundated by Chinese. Now come to Ethiopia, by the law, the law doesn't allow Chinese to engage in, uh, in retail businesses and small fur businesses. So it is up, up to us. I think uh, we, we can design in such a way that uh, we protect uh, uh, the employment for uh, the local people. I think I've, I'm, I've finished what you gave me. Uh, yeah, so. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, I would like to call on Carlos and Linda if they would like to give some contributions to what yeah. the professor. Yeah, I just, I just wanted to, to add on the, because if there's a couple of uh, questions on employment and that was the focus of our four-year research project um, where we did um, quite substantial large-scale surveys of workers in in two sectors in both Angola and Ethiopia and in fact <clears throat> uh, the the these two examples Angola and Ethiopia were not um, casual uh, they were by design because we expected Angola to be very very different from Ethiopia which is why the point that um, Alemayo was making at the end about you know a lot of this depends on what the government does is, is absolutely uh, true. Um, there's a huge difference between Ethiopia and Angola when it comes to um, the, the extent to which Chinese firms generated jobs and the kinds of uh, control mechanisms that exist uh, in the two countries uh, and that can be used to discipline firms in terms of the labor recruitment policies. Ethiopia is a good example, I have to say, where you barely notice any difference between Chinese firms and other foreign firms when it comes to the proportion of expat labor in, the, in their um, premises, especially in the manufacturing sector, we did not find any difference. Um, and of course, I mean, that has to do with the types of investors, the type of sector is different, you know, how it works in Ethiopia and Angola. But primarily one of the main reasons was the Ethiopian government being far stricter when it came to visas, working visas for foreign expat labor so and so in angola for example we did find that i mean angola is probably one of the countries in africa where you have the lowest percentage of local labor and still in chinese firms it was above 70 percent 72 to 75 percent a bit lower than all the foreign companies but by and large if you looked at construction companies in these in these sectors um they were full of Brazilian and Portuguese employees at different levels, you know, but generally sort of skilled labor and, and managerial technical stuff and so on. 
uh, more than in Chinese, uh, less than in Chinese firms, but not too far. So it is certainly something that is up to governments to decide how they want to discipline and encourage or, or sort of force firms to only um, um, recruit expat labor for very particular positions. For example, in manufacturing firms in Ethiopia, this is a big challenge for some of the manufacturing, especially the foreign investors that um, operate within very demanding global production networks where they need a managerial workforce that is hard to find in Ethiopia, right? So you will see in many firms, this is not Chinese firms, uh, many other firms, you would see many Sri Lankan and Indian uh, managers and supervisors in, in the factory floor still. But in general, that used to happen in the early days where these firms were starting operations. And this was part of the kind of negotiation that took place between the firms and the Ethiopian government saying, look, you know, we can't possibly start operations without a suitable managerial workforce, especially in the first three, four years of operations. I mean, this is something that many investors told us. But then the government comes back and knocks on the door and say, well, you don't need them anymore. You know, where are the Ethiopian managers? Uh, um, where are you going to employ them? So, so there is a follow up that is quite interesting happening in the Ethiopian context, uh, which could teach a lot of lessons to many other African countries with these kinds of controls, this kind of discipline simply is not there. I mean, the example that uh, Alema, you gave of, of Zambia is, is relevant, especially if this happens for, for in, in the services sector, in trade, but also in these other critical sectors as construction and manufacturing where creation of employment, the creation of jobs is absolutely critical. So just to finish, by and large, despite the fact that Chinese firms, well, maybe they have a lower percentage of local labor compared to others, not massively lower at all, uh, but in absolute terms, they have created many more jobs than other foreign firms, precisely because of the scale of their operations. So that's why, you know, it's, it's, it's a myth that continues to circulate. And I think it's important to, uh, uh, to debunk. Um, and I think just one, one small comment on, on lessons uh, from China, etc. I think the, the key thing, and Ethiopia again is an example of that, is not about learning from China specifically is learning from multiple examples. And, and, and my understanding from what uh, Ethiopian policymakers did, like precisely Arkebe, who's been mentioned here, was, was to very much focus on policy learning by looking both at successful examples and failures. So Ethiopian policymakers you know, visited Singapore, uh, uh, China, Malaysia, Mauritius, Madagascar, uh, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, there's so much to learn from Bangladesh and Sri Lanka or Mauritius as there is from uh, China. And I think this is probably the way forward so that you can create your own environment. What, what is it that is likely to work in Ethiopia or in Rwanda or in Zambia? Is it an industrial park? Okay, but what kind of industrial park? Where should industrial parks be, be located? I think that is a question that is relevant for Ethiopia and where I think the point that uh, Alema, you raised about the politics is relevant. It is quite possible that some industrial parks in Ethiopia are located in the wrong places for political reasons, okay? Whereas other industrial parks are actually quite promising in terms of, you know, the capacity they firms have there to, to, to compete internationally. So otherwise, many firms would have left Alemayu. I mean, you know, if you take Bolelemi or Hawassa and other, despite logistics cost, you're absolutely right. But despite logistics cost, uni labor costs remain still low, okay? The key issue, however, is, as you mentioned at the end, is political stability. Once political stability goes out of the window, then we do have a serious problem. Thank this you. is where the investors really start freaking out. Sorry to cut you. Thank you, Carlos. Um, Linda, yeah. do you have um, final contributions to make? You have about yes. a minute? I mean, I don't think there was any specific question, but like just a couple of quick points, I guess. The first one is on, on this last point that Carlos was, was discussing about sort of learning from China in a way. So, for, for, so, so this depends, right, on what is the China model? What, what do we define as the China model? There's no clear definition of what the China model is, and therefore it's difficult to learn. So if we mean that African countries need to 
you know, follow the same path that China did through infrastructure development, uh, industrial parks, or special economic zones, and, you know, letting some get rich before others and so on and so forth. I don't think that's the, the China model that they should follow. I think the, the real lesson is, is about the pragmatism, is about like the sort of getting, getting, uh, getting lessons and adapting them to your specific context. A bit, you know, what Carlos was mentioning. Um, maybe one final point that I'd like to raise, because there was no question on this, but I think it's quite interesting, actually, is to think about all of these, all of these engagements between China and Africa in the context now of the African continental free trade area, which is, you know, work in progress. Um, so African countries are coming together to um, develop the soft infrastructure to trade freely among themselves. So to create this continental free trade area, which I think is very is a very interesting initiative, not necessarily because I believe that you know free trade should be everywhere and everyone should be in free trade areas, but because it's an African-led initiative. So it's really something that's coming from, from the will of African governments to build this. So as I mentioned, African governments are are doing this. And one of the reasons why they are is that they see that they really have challenges in exporting manufactured goods. But there's a lot of intra-African trade of manufactured goods. So Kenya struggles really to export its manufacturers to Europe, for example, but it does export quite successfully to Uganda or, or to Rwanda or other countries in the region. So potentially the African continental free trade area is a way to promote uh, industrialization in Africa if, if done properly. And African countries are building the soft infrastructure, but there's also ways in which China's contribution can be can help this by building the hard infrastructure that you still need to trade, to transport these goods from one part of the continent to the other. Um, and also by sort of investing in the manufacturing sector, as we say, which sort of boosts domestic production. So in a way, maybe this sort of like policy, uh, these agents in terms of policy and this will in terms of policy can come in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a continental context also, not just in the national context. Thank you so much, Linda. Almehud, I don't know if you like um, to give us your final thoughts. Uh, uh, good. Uh, just one, one point on Linda's, the continental free uh, trade area. Uh, Actually, if you guys are interested, I did a paper last year on empirical evaluation of the trade, the, the trade effects of the continental free trade area. And you know, the, the message, two messages I got was one, A, the expectation, I mean, the political process was excellent, the enthusiasm, but don't expect a lot. Because I, when we when we when we examine the the pattern of trade, and you know the toughest, the sophistication of commodities, what we found was a complementarity between trade. We took top ten products of each country and compared it import and export. Complementarity is a huge problem. Only four or five countries have the potential to supply manufactured goods. Tunisia, Kenya, South Africa, uh, Mauritius, and very few. And if you compare the comparative advantage of these potential suppliers with the current suppliers, like the Chinese, Indians, the OECD, uh, only Tunisia has a comparative advantage of what? Rebel comparative advantage. So we are by half less, 50% uh, less than the current suppliers. So therefore, we concluded, like Linda, we concluded the, the, the continental free trade area would be an excellent thing if only it is combined with continental or regional industrial strategy. That could include China, protection of, uh, protection of uh, impact industries, compensation mechanism, what have you, so the details. So I just want to add that only in this point. Otherwise, I'm done. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. It's been a very amazing time, you know, listening to our guest speaker and the discussion. So just to give you information on the next webinar, it will be on the wealth inequality and cost of the poverty gap in Arab countries amidst COVID with Khalid Abu Ismail and Valdemar Hasley from UN. ESCWA in Beirut, and our colleague Randa Alami, and a discussion by our Professor Emeritus Masoud Kashinas, 
So this webinar will take place on Wednesday, 10th February at 5 p.m. UK time. So um, I think that's it for today. Thank you everyone for coming. Thank you, Professor Almehu. It's been an awesome time. Thank you, Carlos. Thank you, Linda. Um, hope to see you next time on the next webinar series. Yeah. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you. It was thank a pleasure. You. See you soon, Alema. See, see you, Linda. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Alex, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thanks. Bye.